Math 2414, Calculus 2. Section 9.2, Calculus with Parametric Curves. Video 3 of 9, The Cycloid. Full disclosure. At the end of the previous class, prior to your test on Thursday of last week, we wrapped up Section 9.1, and I mentioned there was one topic, I didn't, topic that I did not get to. That was the cycloid. We're going to get to it now because some of the examples I'm going to ask you to do involve this, this, this parametric curve and its parametric equations. Let me start by kind of explaining the situation, and then I'll elaborate on what all these letters and lines are. Imagine you have a circle sitting at the origin on the ground. So the center's not at the origin, the center's up here somewhere. Let's say the radius is r, and so the center would be at zero comma r if we had the circle sitting on the origin. And then we make a mark of where a point is, namely the point where it's on the ground before it starts rolling. And then we start rolling it. The question we're gonna to attempt to answer is, what is the path of this point on the ground as we roll, that's initially on the ground, as we roll this circle forwards in the positive direction along the x-axis. You can imagine that this point is going to come off of the ground, eventually peak. In fact, we know how high it'll get to get to the top. And then at some point, it's gonna roll back down again. Then it's gonna to have to go back up. So we're expecting a graph that kind of looks like this. When we keep track of where this point is on the circle when we start rolling it from left to right. But we wanna come up with the equations that define this curve parametrically. So the first thing we have to do is decide what should the parameter be to keep track of where we are between the beginning and after rolling them so far. Now, there's a couple of options. We could keep track on how far the circle has traveled horizontally, but because it's a circle and it's rotating, it makes sense to talk about how much it's rotated. So what I've drawn here, there's this dotted red and black circle where the, where the original circle started tangent to the x-axis at the origin, with its center at zero comma r. And then we've rotated a little bit. So its center is over here. It's still up r because the circle is still sitting on the x-axis. We don't know how far over it is yet. As far as the angle of rotation, we're gonna keep track of how the angle between the radius connecting the point wherever it is at that time, so right here, and the radius that's still tangent to the x-axis. So imagine keeping track of this line as we rotate the circle. You know, and theta is gonna be our parameter, our rotation, our angular rotation parameter, if you will. Our objective is to find the equations that give us the coordinates of this point, the point on the circle that was originally on the origin before we started rotating the circle. This green arc kind of represents the path that the circle is taking. Now, I went ahead and took the liberty of labeling a few things. I've called the center of the circle C. That makes sense. I called the point on the circle that was originally at the origin P. I called the origin O. And I called the point on the circle where it's tangent to the x-axis T. And again, that will change as we rotate. I'll introduce a fifth point here in a moment. But how the heck are we going to pull this off? Now, the answer is some basic trigonometry and some basic geometry. The first thing we should probably do is figure out what this x-coordinate is of the center if we've rotated this far. And the trick to that lies in two observations. Number one, whatever the distance between O and T is, it should match this arc length on the circle. Imagine just unwrapping the circle, just cutting it right here and then laying it out. It kind of makes sense that the distance from O to T is equal to the arc length from P to T. In other words, this arc length is equal to that. If we were to roll it back over, it would just match up. The second thing we need to do is figure out how big this arc length is relative to the angle of rotation and the radius. Because if we can, then since these are equal, this would just be the x-coordinate of our center. Well, to answer the question, what's the arc length based on the angle of rotation is pretty easy because we know that from, from basic trigonometry that arc length, which I'm gonna call S, is just R times theta. In other words, the radius times the angle, this is assuming that theta is in radians. In fact, that's the definition of radians. The radian measure of an arc, of an angle, a central angle in a circle, is just the arc length divided by the radius. 
So the arc length is the radius times the angle of rotation. Well, if s is equal to r theta, that means that this distance is equal to r theta, which means that's the x-coordinate of the center of the circle after it's rotated. All right, that's a good start. But how are we going to finish this? Well, to finish this, we have to draw a new, well, we need a triangle. Let's face it, trigonometry is mostly about triangles. The, the prefix trigon comes from a polygon with three sides, aka a triangle. Trigon, as in trigonometry. So we need a right triangle, and the right triangle we're going to build needs to have an angle of theta in it somewhere. I'm going to move this up a little bit because of the way I have it sketched right now, it's in the way. Theta is right there. The right triangle we're going to make, we're going to make by taking P and projecting it to the right until it hits this radius. And we're going to call a point where it hits CT, Q. And now we're going to do some trigonometry and some basic algebra. The first observation we're going to make is about this x-coordinate. The x-coordinate, if you project it down here to the x-axis, is simply right here. So we know that x plus this is going to equal uh, ot. So in other words, we know x plus whatever this is, and I think I'm going to go ahead and bring in another letter. P, I guess r is the next letter. If we project the point P down to the x-axis, then we would know that x, however long it is, plus the length of RT has to equal the length of OT, which is R theta. Remember, that's how long this is. So we know that x is equal to R theta minus the length of RT. Well, what's the length of RT? It's the same as the length of PQ. Well, PQ is sitting in this triangle. Let's pull this triangle out for a second. P Q, C. Here's our theta. We want to know what this equals because that matches uh, RT. Um, well, we need another side. If we're going to do a trig function. We need two sides at an angle. Wait a minute. The hypotenuse of that is just the radius of the circle. That means that if we set up sine as opposite over hypotenuse, we know sine of theta is equal to the side PQ divided by R, which means the side PQ, or at least its, its length, is R times sine theta. But PQ is the same as RT, which means I can take away this RT, replace it with R sine theta. Just for kicks and giggles, we'll factor out the R. And just like that, we have, R, we have the X coordinate of this point after rotating the circle in an angle of theta radians as a function of theta. Now remember, the r is a constant, so theta is the only parameter here. Let's write that down. x of theta is equal to r times theta minus sine of theta. A little weird, normally x is associated with cosine, but that's okay. But what about the y-coordinate? For the y-coordinate of this point, let's look at segment Q, uh, CT over here. The y-coordinate we're looking for is here. And we know that y plus the segment qc should be r. In other words, this piece plus this piece should be that piece. y plus cq is equal to r, or qc. That means y is equal to r minus qc. And we can use the same triangle over here. But now we're looking for cq or qc, whichever one you want to call it. That would be cosine. Cosine of that angle is the adjacent side, which is cq over r. That means CQ is equal to R cosine theta. So let's replace CQ or QC, whichever way you want to describe it, with R cosine theta. If we factor the R out of that, we get Y of theta is equal to R times 1 minus cosine theta. I'll be honest, I usually don't have the cycloid equations memorized, parametric equations memorized. I kind of remember how to derive them, though. I say kind of because I've been looking at my book. But these are the equations of the cycloid. And we can use it to figure out what the path of that point looks like as we roll this from left to right by doing just a little bit of analysis. I'm not going to overanalyze it right now. But starting at theta equals 0, 0 minus sine of 0 is 0. Our x coordinate is 0. That makes sense. We haven't rotated yet. And when theta is equal to 0, cosine of 0 is 
uh, 1. 1 minus 1 is 0 times the radius is 0. So yeah, we're at the origin. But how long does it take for this to hit the ground again? Well, that's like asking what's the next th value of theta that makes the y-coordinate equal to 0? Well, cosine has a period of 2 pi. And the only place on the unit circle where cosine is equal to 0 is on the right side of it. So if we start out at theta equals zero, make a complete revolution, we're not over here again until two pi. In other words, our cycloid has a period of two pi, at which point it's going to bounce and go back up again. Now it looks like there's a vertical tangent line there. We can check it by solving the first derivative of the x coordinate equal to zero. And you would see that, yep, there's a vertical tangent line there. All right, so in the next example, and it's not the only one, we got a couple of examples where we're gonna be using the cycloid, but in the next one, we're going to be finding, uh, what are we gonna be finding, I forgot. In the next example, we are going to be finding doo -doo 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 -doo, uh, tangents at certain points, and where is the tangent line horizontal? Now, our instinct should kind of tell us where it's horizontal. Halfway across, and two pi later and where it's vertical, but the analysis we do in the next video will confirm what our instincts say. It's really great when your calculus work confirms what you think should be true. It's also enlightening when it, when it rejects what you think should be true.